La Nina is coming on fast, and that could have significant ramifications for the upcoming hurricane season. What's going on, guys? Certified meteorologist Jonathan Keg is back with you to talk about all of that. The chances increasing that we do get La Nina to come around for summer and hurricane season. We're going to talk about what that means. There are some significant clues popping up for the upcoming season. We're going to show you that. And then by the end of this video, you're going to know how ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, the driving parent oscillation between El Nino and La Nina, impact a season. So you're going to know that by the end of the video. We're going to do that all without scare tactics and hype. I want to be clear about that. We're going to break all this down with sound meteorology and science so that you know what to expect going forward. If you like that stuff, hit that subscribe button for me and join this growing weather community as we round out winter, head into spring severe weather season and eventually hurricane season. We're starting off with a sea surface temperature anomaly. This is the calling card of Enso, El Nino or La Nina. When I showed you this months ago, this was all Beat red, the sea surface temperature is way above normal. Now, look at that. We have the blues showing up. That means that La Nina is starting to surge and it's going to come on quick. I'll show you more on that coming up in a couple of minutes, but El Nino is fading fast. La Nina is coming on strong. So here are the tracks now, and I want to get through this quick so I don't leave anybody hanging here. Again, this is kind of the meat and potatoes of this video, and it's really, really important. Look at the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. This is where I want to focus on, at least over the next couple of minutes here. Note in the strong El Nino seasons, and I'm categorizing this as 1.5 degrees Celsius and above. That is a strong El Nino. Last year, we peaked the El Nino at 2 degrees Celsius above normal in the equatorial Pacific and that Nino 3.4 region. 1965, 1972, 1982, 87, 97, 2015, and 2023. All those lines on your screen there are tropical systems that developed in those years. So that's all those hurricane seasons on this map. There's a lot going on here, but note how there's not much activity in the Gulf and in the Caribbean. It certainly can happen. We had a Dahlia last year. That was a big storm in an El Nino year that did make it into the Gulf, but it is kind of the anomaly to the norm. Look at all the action out in this direction though, that kind of missed land during a strong El Nino season. Okay, take that mental picture right here. The next thing I'm gonna show you is a La Nina following a strong El Nino and the tracks that happened during those La Nina hurricane seasons that followed a strong El Nino, like what we'll see in 2024. So that is 1973, 83, 88, 95, 98, 2010, and 2016. Those are the La Nina hurricane seasons that I have plotted right here. Note the difference. Look at what has happened in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. A ton more lines, a ton more storms venture through the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico during a La Nina year following a strong El Nino. So again, that is significant that not only could we have more storms as we typically would do, would have in a La Nina year, but the storms could also be more impactful. It doesn't matter how many storms we have if they all stay out at sea. Certainly it's not good for the shipping channels, but we're talking about human impact here. And if you have more storms getting into the Caribbean, and especially the Gulf of Mexico, there's really nowhere for those storms to go but hit land. So it's certainly something we don't want to see, and it's something that we are going to be following very, very closely as we head into hurricane season and certainly as we get into the season itself. So again, it's a, a trend that we are watching, and it's kind of a, a, a trend that is screaming at us some significant tracks could be possible as we head into the 2024 hurricane season. I want to show you now every month, the second Thursday of every month, so that is going to be today, March 14th, and the reason why we're doing the video is the Climate Prediction Center releases their official ENSO forecast. There's a La Nina watch and play that was issued in February. The chances for La Nina to get here by the peak of hurricane season and by hurricane season in general have gone up since the February update. So I wanted to show you that. The red bar here, that's the probability for El Nino. We're still at 100%. That is for the February, March, April timeframe. And so is categorized in that three month average. So you need to have that temperature anomaly, the sea surface temperature anomaly above or below normal by half a degree Celsius for that three month average to be characterized and categorized as a La Nina an El Nino or Enso neutral, which is the gray bar. Note what happens by the April, May, June timeframe. The red bar is itty bitty 
and we had the blue bar starting to come up, although it looks like through spring we're going to transition into ENSO neutral, neither La Nina or El Nino, but then look at this. June, July, August, the summer time frame, we're over 60%. And then here we go. I want to focus your attention now where my trusty arrow is at. August, September, October, we have this blue line going north of 80% now. If you remember from the video we did in February, that percentage was at 74%. So we've increased that percentage by six points, where at least NOAA and the Climate Prediction Center has. And then it continues to strengthen into deeper into summer and deeper into hurricane season which obviously is not good news we'll talk much more about why that's not good news and some of the science and meteorology behind how la nina impacts the hurricane season but just know la nina typically means more hurricanes more tropical systems developing in the atlantic basin and i showed you some of those tracks again really increasing the activity into the caribbean and gulf of mexico during those la nina years following a strong el nino which again is the 2024 season that we're heading into now i want to show you some model model predictions here there's the zero degree celsius line in white can hardly see that i'll use my yellow line there's 0.5 above that would be el nino and there's 0.5 below that would be la nina this green line let me bring out my arrow again this green line right here is the average and you see that tanking all the way by the time we get into fall it could be one degree celsius below normal so that would be getting into a strengthening uh, la nina some go even further that's crazy if it would get that strong but the average again is right here so that's what we're going to use for this video and this time being by the start of summer we're still getting close or right along that line but then by early summer the july august september average time frame average of the models would suggest that we are going to be in a la nina and then certainly for the august september october line uh three month average the peak of hurricane season it would be a full-fledged la nina and again that is why the la nina watch is issued before we talk about what la nina is because that is important and i want you to walk away from this video also understanding what la nina is and again that's part of the whole scare tactic thing that i want to make sure you know what that is so when you hear some things you're not freaked out okay so we're doing this with science and meteorology but check out this screen now where my mouse is this is the temperature anomaly over the last seven days this is from tropicaltidbits.com and you see all the blue there this is the area that we're concerned with the nino 3.4 region uh, where we categorize el nino or la nina look at all the blue that is the crazy onset very very fast onset of la nina so we are cooling that water in the equatorial pacific where the calling card and where the categorization of el nino and la nina take place we cool that water by upwelling the trade winds are strengthening and when the trade winds strengthen it pushes that warm water closer to australia we're looking off the uh, peruvian coast here of south america the equatorial pacific okay and when you're pushing that warm water away you have to replace it with something this is known as upwelling so that colder air that resides beneath the surface of the ocean is kind of lifted up it pushes up to the surface and that is how we cool the sea surface temperatures in this part of the world to get la nina to develop all this equates to sinking air developing over the eastern pacific if air is sinking over the eastern pacific that means it is rising over the atlantic so that is one of the byproducts here that it's not good for a la nina to be around during hurricane season there's more rising air in the atlantic which leads to thunderstorm development if other conditions are right that's where we get more tropical cyclone development depressions storms hurricanes in the atlantic basin so that's one of the things that's not the best about la nina being around the other byproduct of this is decreased wind shear hurricanes do not like wind shear they like their environment to be nice and calm the thunderstorms develop vertically and the wind shear kind of slices and tilts the storm that's not good for a hurricane it's great for us we love when that's around but when there's weakened wind shear brought on by la nina those storms have a much better wind shear environment to grow and thrive. Now, it doesn't mean, just because you hear La Nina, it doesn't mean it's a slam dunk, gangbusters, oh my gosh, we're going to have a super hyperactive season. Certainly, it would look that way, and I'm going to show you some other reasons and other things that would 
present that. But there are still limiting factors. How much Saharan dust is going to stick around early in the season. There could be some drier air involved. Uh, there could be a more active Eastern Pacific season than expected, although typically that is also a quieter year because it's the opposite. And if that's around, it might get into play of disrupting things going on in the Atlantic. That would be awesome. But nonetheless, it does look like we are going to turn things very, very active. The other thing here, and I'll end with this, is that the sea surface temperatures in the main development region, which is defined as the area from the Lesser Antilles to the Cabo Verde Islands, those are those waves that roll off of Africa and work their way across or work their way up. Those are those big, long-track hurricanes that we often see once we get into the late August and especially September months, the peak of hurricane season. We're already at record levels. These are more July-like temperatures. So anything that would come off of Africa, really going to have an opportunity to strengthen. Now, one of the other caveats is I showed you where we could have a much more active hurricane season this year, right down into the Caribbean to the Gulf of Mexico. But depending upon how the steering currents shake out, Typically, when you get a storm strong fast, they like to curve. They feel some of the steering currents. Now, if we do get a really, uh, if we get the Bermuda High to set up and steer things in, it may not matter. It's one of the things that we are going to watch. But nonetheless, that is one of the things that the water temperature is already record warm and already summer-like out in the main development region. We also have some slightly warmer anomalies in the Caribbean. It's not crazy, but we're already warmer than normal in the Gulf and the Caribbean. Not as extreme as what you see out here with the darker oranges, reds, and certainly purples off of Cabo Verde Islands. The other thing I want to point out here, I mentioned about the rising air is more prolific in the Atlantic during a La Nina season. We also have the colder temperature anomalies here on top of the warmer anomalies. That also helps to induce rising air, increasing the temperature gradient a little bit, and that helps to get more rising motion in the Atlantic as well to promote more thunderstorm development and then eventually to potentially promote more tropical development as well, given other factors, the rest of the water temperature, wind shear, moisture in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, things like that um, around that could prohibit development. So two things off the bat that aren't good, the water temperature in the Atlantic and the trend that La Nina is coming on fast. So again, there certainly could be a really active hurricane season. We don't care if it's active, if they all stay out at sea. I know it messes up the shipping lanes. I said that before, and that's not good either. But we want to keep it away from land. For our friends in the Caribbean, our friends in the U.S. and Central America, we don't want any of that, of course. So again, as we go forward, we're going to break down what we see scientifically, what we see meteorologically, without the fear tactics, without the hype that you see on other channels. I want to make sure that everybody knows what they can expect. And again, at least from my perspective, I used to be terrified of thunderstorms as a kid until I learned what was going on the process that makes thunderstorms. Now I know, and I'd like to share that information with you guys, and we're gonna get through the season together here, no matter what it throws in our direction. But again, with La Nina, with these water temperatures, it's certainly not the best news I could pass along. But again, the season hasn't started just yet. We'll keep you posted as we get closer to the season, and certainly as we roll on through hurricane season. Thank you guys so much for being here again. If you liked what you saw and you want to stay updated on the weather as we roll out of winter, roll into the severe weather season for spring uh, in the United States, and of course, hurricane season from the Caribbean into Central America, into the U.S., into the rest of the Atlantic and parts of South America, you've come to the right place. Hit that subscribe button for me. Post in the comments where you're tuning in from, and we will catch you next time.